So greetings, 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 Andrea. I so appreciate your consistent visionary leadership and all the solidarity and love that you show in, in, in your work. And I'm, I'm humbled to be able to have this conversation with you. As always, we begin things at Setsi by acknowledging our creator, our ancestors, the original stewards, the various lands we're on. We acknowledge all those who toiled without compassion or compensation. We acknowledge all our elders and community stalwarts whose shoulders we stand on as we share, build, and learn together for our collective liberation and sovereignty. So Andrea, please introduce yourself to our listeners and viewers and tell us a bit about your remarkable work. Mm, thank you. Hi, Victor. It's so nice to be here with you today. So my name's Andrea. I'm currently uh, coming to you from my home office in Toronto. And I just want to take a moment to acknowledge the, the many nations who have been on this land before me, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, Chippewa, Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. And, you know, the many diverse folks that have sort of been here to, to steward this land so that I could be here today. Um, I, yeah, I'm the CEO, current CEO of Social Innovation Canada. We're working to try and create systems change at a national level on key issues around uh, complex challenges that require a multi-sectoral approach. That's incredible. Well, congratulations on all the work that you're doing. We appreciate you. So please, what, what's inspiring you right now about your work? What's really motivating you to, you know, to drive and continue to press systems? Yeah, you know, I just, I've always felt, yeah, you're talking about, about uh, honoring your ancestors. And I was really taught by my parents that change is both urgent and possible. That there's good in, in all of us and that there are unintended consequences. And the more I look at things, that the more I can see how people who are wanting to have a positive impact are getting stuck in systems that are not creating the outcomes that we want as a society or as individuals. And so I think that that's what's, that's what's inspiring me is the potential of the future, the potential of the possible. That's absolutely beautiful. We, we need inspiration these times. We need the motivation as we try and tackle some of these very pervasive challenges. So that's a perfect segue to my next question. What are some of the challenges and barriers that you face in your work? And what are some of the approaches you and your team are taking to overcome some of these challenges? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, one of the challenges, and I just want to take a moment today because we're, you know, we're in a situation where on the weekend we had two devastating events. There's a massive earthquake in Afghanistan. 2,500 people just died. And Israel declared war on Palestine. We've got the situation of a you know potential third world conflict, you know, World War Three between um, what's going on in Europe and now in the Middle East. And so that that combination of climate and social unrest is creating so much anxiety and 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 fear and pain and hardship. Uh, and the individuals that are being impacted and and all of those who are watching are just, you know, feeling feeling that that's quite difficult. And if we're not careful, it can render us a little bit uh, unable to act. Um, so in some ways, you know, that's one of the challenges is the is the urgency is so great right now. The problems are large, and it can feel overwhelming. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. My wife always gets mad at me. I'm a huge fan, fan of Amy Goodman, and I, I go to bed watching <laughs> Democracy Now! and wake up watching it. I'm always like, why do you do this to yourself? Like, why do you want to? But I think um, a lot of times when uh, like my father always taught me to, to, to think globally, but act locally. And I think in these times, we actually have to think and act locally and globally in any way that we can. And I think in honoring not just our ancestors, but our ascendants, our children and our grandchildren, 
we, we, we have to be on the right side of history in terms of our ability to mobilize, organize, be true to power, and find ways and means to leave the planet better than we found this, you know? So, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of work to be done. I appreciate your candor and transparency, as always. So do you have a, a set of key priorities right now at Social Innovation Canada that's driving you? Yeah, absolutely. And so... Social Innovation Canada has a history of being sort of an ecosystem builder. We were supporting the the folks that were working on the ground in place in identity-based communities uh, around capacity building. And recently we've had a little bit of a transition. I feel like they've been aligning the, the sector for action and now it's time to actually apply what we know and really start to see some, try and see if we can create the kinds of changes that we know needs to happen that we feel can actually only be achieved through these multi-sectored approaches that center equity and those impacted by the challenges in the approach. And so we're, we have three areas of work. One, we still continue to support the ecosystem, convening, uh, and sort of connecting folks to resources, opportunities, and each other. The next area of work is a transformational practice. And so that's where we're doing labs and challenges and collaborations, multi-sector collaborations on issues of national significance. And so this is moving beyond learning the practice, honing the practice of social innovation, but actually applying it to these issues that need to be done at a national level. So, um, and we're of course a network, so we don't do all of the work by any means. We have, so we have collaborators in BC at Radius who are doing incredible work on refugee livelihoods labs. We have folks in Quebec at La Mise who are working on equitable climate solutions and, and rural uh, agricultural issues. We've got folks at Inspiring Communities who are looking to create you know, inclusive economies and community wealth. And similarly with CSI working, people really working communities. That's just to name a few. Diane at, at Boldness is working to create, you know, better outcomes for the families in the North end of Winnipeg and apply indigenous innovation approaches. Uh, well, the area that I've been really digging into in, personally has been around housing. So we've been looking at affordable housing as a way to show this new approach of building the ecosystem, uh, looking for the lever points, a labs approach, and then working on our third area, which is to see if we can start to unlock some of the barriers and increase the resources to the solutions that are being actually created on the ground. You know, the other thing that inspires me is what I see in community sort of every day, these diff, you know, folks that are working against these structures that are, are brittle in the most innovative of ways, finding solutions to actually be able to create the impact that they need in their communities, whether it's community bonds or affordable housing rates, or whatever it happens to be at their level, they're finding workarounds and innovations to actually solve their problems because they need to. What we find is that all of those problems are working against a system that's that's not conducive. And when we spoke to folks across the country, they said, we need some policy support. We need, because we can't do the national stuff. We've got our hands full here in our communities. We've got our hands full with our specific issues. We can't make the structural changes. We need resources because they're not flowing in the right ways. And we need um, we need people to tell our stories and to connect us to each other. And so the third area of work is around actually trying to create the solutions that will enable the solutions that we know are out there in communities across the country. Absolutely. And, and to that point, it's like we've spoken at length around non-market solutions to, to housing and even some of the inspiring work that SHARE is doing around mandatory disclosures, around real estate investment trusts or REITs. Um, but this is a perfect segue to my next question. So you're 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 heavily involved, and I, I was involved in the inception as well, around the Sustainable Finance Forum that's coming up November 2nd and November 3rd in Ottawa at the Shaw Centre. And um, the two of us have been working diligently to ensure that um, voices are heard, and we, we we center justice, access, inclusion, diversity, and equity. So my question to you is, how do you feel about the future of social innovation in Canada um, based off of all these different subsets? Like I know 
I, I, I'm finding ways and means to almost be evangelical around sustainable finance globally, because it's not just a Canadian based conversation, but how do you feel about the future of social innovation in Canada? So, you know, I just, um, I just co-authored a, an op-ed with Tim Draymond and that's going to be in the Hill Times, I think in the next couple of weeks that asked about, yeah, they asked about uh, social innovation. So the challenge of social innovation is that nobody knows what it is, but really, if you can imagine even a tiniest portion of the dollars we spend on innovation in this country being applied in an efficient way to our most pressing social environmental challenges, that's social innovation. That would actually allow us to, social innovation for me is about applying innovation approaches and practices to our complex social and environmental challenges. It's differentiated in that traditional innovation is really looking to create, you know, I shouldn't, I shouldn't use that face. I mean, I, you know, it's great to have a thriving marketplace. It's wonderful to have jobs. You know, innovation is about creating economic growth. We know, however, that economic growth does not always drive social and environmental outcomes in a positive way. And so it's interesting to think about what if we were using our public dollars to drive social and environmental outcomes that would then drive economic benefit and jobs. And what would that look like? Because we have a real challenge with innovation in this country. It gets invested in by foreign investors and the benefits do not stay here. The jobs leave, the profits leave, it's subsidized by our government. We all know our innovation system is not working the way we want it to. And that's despite so much, you know, so much, incredible universities, incredible people, and so much talent and, and opportunity. And so I think I'm hoping that the future of social innovation um, is similar to the path of social finance and sustainable finance, and that it starts to be integrated into our current innovation approaches in this country. Indeed, indeed, indeed. And I'm looking forward to that op-ed. I remember when we were first, uh, when SETSI was just a community coalition, Tim Draymon um, was one of the first colleagues that I reached out to, and the two of us met, this is before Zoom, before COVID, a very long time ago, um, and we met at Ryerson, or TMU now, uh, Toronto Metropolitan University, for a coffee. And we had, it was like a 15-minute meeting or 30-minute meeting, it ended up being almost an hour. So I'll, I'll look out for that op-ed, because Tim is a remarkable um, colleague and advisor in, in the space. So um, congratulations on the op-ed in the Hill Times. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yes. It's, um, it's nice to know people are interested in new ways to do things. An ecosystem, you know, social innovation, social finance, social impact, social justice. We're all part of this movement towards what we hope will be a more just and equitable future. Absolutely. And I think that multi-sector approach is so important. So my last meeting for the day was around just land access and the fact mm -hmm. that you have folks in the food sovereignty movements advocating and fighting to find ways to access land. Then you have folks in the affordable housing space fighting private sector and private markets and private actors to access land. And then you also have social purpose real estate for like the, but a lot of times these multi, these, these different ecosystems sometimes struggle to collaborate. And I think the beautiful thing about SI Canada and the nodes you've built and the framework you've built um, creates an opportunity for different ecosystem actors and unlikely allies to collaborate on some of these pervasive challenges. So once again, congratulations yeah. on the stellar work that you're doing. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you know, what, what you're describing is something that's been so well documented in terms of unintended adversaries. And, and it's really, it's the kind of thing that can really be well exposed through a systems approach when you can able to honor everyone's contribution, um, honor their ability to contribute to the shift, and also to really understand what their limitations are and, and what folks' role can be. Because when we rely on people to do things they can't do. That's when we start to get very disappointed. You know, we I want to I want to just touch back on you mentioned something around non-market housing and and this has been, you know, going through 
the process of applying social innovation to the affordable housing crisis, starting with understanding financialization as a systems level change that occurred you know, 20, 40 years ago and with the securitization, understanding what the high interest rates have done to our, our country over the last 20 to 40, 20 years, you know, they're not, I mean, the high interest rates, the low interest rates and the high housing prices and, and really looking at all of that from a systems level perspective has led me to the uh, unwavering belief that the creation of a strong and viable non-market housing sector in this country would be transformational. And I think we can do it. We have the tools, we have the capacity, we have the willingness at the government. And that's why I'm so excited to be coming to the Sustainable Finance Forum. We have the minister in the room listening. We have the finance, the financial institutions, we have the nonprofits, we have all of the actors, the co-ops. Everyone wants to find a solution to this housing challenge in Canada. And I think we have the answers. So I'm I'm optimistic. No, I'm definitely optimistic. We, we definitely have the thought leaders, the practitioners. I'm really excited about Minister Sean Frazier being able to lean in and hear some of the initiatives, projects, and some of the work happening on the ground. Um, but once again, we need that policy help. And uh, even the actors at CMHC and the housing supply challenge and the work that others are doing. So definitely there's an opportunity and I'm optimistic as well. But once again, we got to do the work. Like Maya Angelou says, nothing will work unless we do, you know? So that's so, right. So just doing that's the work. Right. You know? That's right. And there's a unique moment right now because the CMHC for all of their, their foibles, they have been investing in social innovation in this country. They've invested in over 70 labs. They've been investing in the, in the innovation challenges. They've been investing in the country to be ready to be able to transition to this new non-market housing. There's the most amazing projects happening in communities across the country. And, and so now we do need the government to lean in and create that policy shift and the flow to reduce the barriers and increase the resources so that these all of these little ideas don't fall into that 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 innovation chasm the stag the pilotitis that that plagues so many of pilotitis i like that and that is literally those three year one year two year pilots that sometimes are remarkable stories um and narratives that go in reports that become great data but could really be scaled and amplified and replicated. I find a lot of times when we look at some of these pervasive challenges, it's not a how. We know the how. It's a who and a where. Like, who are the thought leaders and practitioners doing the work? And where are the communities of practice where it's worked? And can they be replicated? So so a, a lot of times, it's not a how. It's a who and a where, you know? So I agree with you completely. Yeah. 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 So my next question is, what is your ultimate goal? And what does success look like to you and your colleagues at Social Innovation mm -hmm. Canada? Well, I, I think our goals, you know, um, probably threefold, right? We want to, we want to support, um, support the field in their capacity to work in socially innovative approaches. And that includes really, uh, you know, there's some decolonizing, there's the incorporation of indigenous ways of knowing and being. We want to be able to support the continued evolution of social innovation approaches. Um, and then we want to actually, you know, fix some stuff. <laughs> we want to actually understand what's needed at a national level so that those who are doing great work in communities uh, can actually do more of it to create agency and autonomy and community wealth and, and a healthier country where everyone can participate. So start reducing some of those barriers for folks who are trying to create a good life for themselves and their families and increase the resources to those kinds of projects, those pilots that we know work. Um, and, and from a systems level, start to shift, you know, create a bit of a paradigm shift so that folks understand the cost of unintended consequences on people and planet. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. 
when I think about the the leadership in the black community that's emerged, the the Tiffany Calendars of Face, Lee Ban, colleagues at FFBC, Craig Wellington at BOF, the Harbor Black North, I think about what you mentioned around indigenous ways of knowing and being. And I think of Chef Sear and Wahi and Caitlin at Raven and Shannon and Sarah McNeil, Fran Richter at NACA and uh, Caroline Hilton and Indigenomics um, and Jocelyn Forsman and Shadi at NAFSI. There's once again, there, there's so many examples of remarkable work happening. But once again, it, it requires the public, private, philanthropic, multiple sectors to identify the who, the where, and find ways and means, once again, to reduce barriers and ensure that resources flow in a way that makes sense for communities. Um, yeah, so 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 that's that's exciting. And once again, I appreciate your transparency, authenticity, and your candid. Um, so this is my second last question for you. And this is more of a personal question. Okay. It's it's your 90th birthday party. Family mm. is around you. Well, what what do you want to hear about the remarkable life that you lived? You know, there's been some moments in in my career so far that have brought me to tears when when I've been told by folks that the work that we did at In Spirit, you know, changed their lives. And we were just doing doing our best, right? Doing our best, <laughs> trying doing our jobs. Um Or when I was told by someone that, you know, I was kind to them. And that made them be able to continue their work. That helped them. And so I think that we're actually measured, you know, I'd like to be able to impact systems change. I feel like there's times when I've seen that happen, whether I was working in Clackwatt Sound at, try and save the old growth rainforest, or I was working on the Declaration of Philanthropy uh, for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, or working on to you know mobilize and socialize impact investing and, and helping to start rally assets. Those are times when I've been able to create, I've been able to be part of a group that has created things that have created system of change. But what we're really, really ultimately judged by is the amount of, um, of love we've shared. And so I think at my 90th birthday, I want to, I want to hear that. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. And I think um, that resonates with many. And once again, I appreciate your transparency and authenticity. So last question, do you have any closing thoughts or calls to action for our listeners and our viewers? You know, I think you have to assume the best of people. You have to understand that they have constraints. Uh, we need to have, we're not going to all agree on things and we're going to come from difficult places and, and we'll have different interests. And, and that's okay. It doesn't mean we can't all be part of the solution. And so uh, I just say, you know, be kind to each other. And let's work together because we've got the stuff to fix this. Ashe, and that's literally why my brilliant colleagues and I um, started this series. We really wanted to humanize the sector. Um, there's the alphabet soup of acronyms and logos. And a lot of times folks don't have access to the hearts, minds, thoughts, um, and sentiments of some of the leaders and folks on the ground. So there's that gap, that chasm of them versus us or that organization. And, and, I, and I think um, one of the things that we've noticed every time we convene um, for one of these conversations and post it um, on a, our platform, it, it creates a dynamic where folks lean in, they ask, they ask questions like, wow, I didn't know this, or I didn't know that, or can you connect me? So, so uh, we're, we're really just grateful and thankful for your integrity, your leadership, your vision, your authenticity. And, and and the genuine nature you came to this, this this conversation with. Thank you so much, Andrea. Really appreciate Aww, it. Victor, you're so, you know, you're such a you're such a connective tissue for us all in this sector. You just hold us all so beautifully uh, with open arms, 
open strong arms. Thank you very much for, for having me. I appreciate yeah. it. I'm, I'm, I'm trying my best. <laughs> You're doing it great. I give thanks. So we'll close the way we began this interview by giving thanks to our creator, by giving thanks to our ancestors, acknowledging the, the original stewards of the various lands we're on. We acknowledge all those who toiled without compassion or compensation. We acknowledge all our elders and community stalwarts whose shoulders we stand on as we build, share, and learn together for our collective liberation and sovereignty. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you, Victor.